All right, so first up, small diaphragm. Now, what I love about small diaphragm microphones is they do a lot of the work for us. With a larger diaphragm, it's just a, can be a little excessive low end. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tilt this one away from the offending item of the acoustic guitar, which is this. The sound hole is so boomy, it really is kind of not your friend. Now, don't get me wrong, you can mic all the way back there and get a, a great overview and also incorporate the sound hole as well. But in this instance, if I want to do something very percussive, I want to pick up the body as well as the strings. So my favorite thing to do, and this was a BBC trick. Actually, one of two, there's another one I can show you in a minute, is to capture the sound of the guitar here. Okay, so the small diaphragm mic, I've got it pointed away from the sound hole onto the body here. And I love this kind of ultra percussiveness for picking up. It's great for arpeggios. It's just really great. And of course, uh, people ask me all the time, what happens if you've got a cutaway? Then you can, of course, mic the top here. You'll get pretty similar results. You will get an emphasis more on some of the, uh, the lower strings and a high, but that sound of picking up the body is just fantastic. It is very bouncy and percussive. So that's this mic pointed here, small diaphragm. At the moment, we've got a fancy Sheps, but honestly, some of the best results I've ever had are with cheap small diaphragms. Because the thing about cheap small diaphragm microphones is they have no low end. And that can be awesome. You just, I think the Lewitt $99 entry model is fantastic on acoustic because it doesn't have any super lows that get in the way. And I just record the guitar. <laughs> And it's put one, it in the mix. One mic, that's it. It's just done. Yeah. It's like, I don't have to EQ it. All the low end's just not there. You don't even cool. have to worry about a hot pass filter at the console. Yeah, it's, the mic's already done all the work for you. So any small diaphragm you've got, fire it up, have a go at it there. All right, so large diaphragm, and I'm going for something a bit more pop. So Jason, we'll flip to the other mic. Now with the... Uh, large diaphragm, you can put it in the same position. Of course you can, you can mic down there. But when I use large diaphragms, I'm looking more for that kind of smiley faced pop acoustic guitar sound. For that, I'm gonna do the classic mic between the 12th and 14th fret, a couple of inches back. So that's in that area here. And I like to go fairly close on it. Some people pull back a little bit, but even, yeah, you know, around about here, 12th to 14th fret, this distance here. You get a really nice full. To me, it's it's classic rhythm acoustic sound. It can be used for arpeggios, but you hear the top end's a little tweak. Doesn't quite have that solidity and percussiveness that you get from miking the body but it's wonderful, absolutely wonderful for just being. I often find the best microphones for acoustic guitars tend to be a little bit more mid-range focused. If I am recording with a preamp that has EQ on it, something like a 1073, I'll go to that like 1.2 frequency and just put a couple of dB on there. I actually like adding some mids to the acoustic. Another secret for recording acoustic guitar in a track is to use a small body acoustic, not actually a D, I'm not a dreadnought, I'm definitely not a jumbo. Rick Rubin's secret when you listen to all of those Chili Peppers records on the record, he uses small body acoustics like triple O's and they, just record beautifully, and again, don't need any extra work. So don't discount the fact that if you've got an array of acoustics you can choose from, start away from jumbos, 
because they're going to be super boomy. And then secondly, you know, a dreadnought could work, but if you've got a triple O or a small body kind of acoustic, try that first. That might just solve the problem. The song that you're recording acoustic in, if you had a, a real thick mix with a lot of instruments yep. and you wanted the acoustic to cut through, would you pick small diaphragm or, or large or would it matter? Interesting question. I would probably take a 57 and put it close to 12th and 14th fret because that's got a kind of a presence lift between the 3 to 5k area and then high pass the schnizzle out of everything. So I got more of a, more of a kind of... And I would also probably use a light pick. So I get a very, and maybe even play back here. Because that's what you're going to hear coming through. Shazza, zazza, zazza. Uh, there's a lot of great mixers. Uh, for instance, Mark Ender's one of my favorite mixers, and he is really good at manipulating the acoustic guitar sound to sound right in the right place. So when it's in the verse, for instance, it's kind of a... Got a big full acoustic sound with hardly any instrumentation going on then when the chorus comes in he'll boost the high mids wipe out all the low ends and you'll get kind of because that will sit in a really dense mix and i think that's true of all mixing you know don't be afraid to automate an eq in different ways for different sections of the song it's a bit like you know in a verse you can have a light amount of reverb going on in the snare because you can hear it but once the chorus comes in and things fill up you're probably making the reverb longer, you're making it louder, but it won't actually feel any different from the verse to the chorus, but you just have to, to have it compete or else that, that snare is gonna sound really super dry, you know, in the chorus. Well, with the acoustic guitar, it's really a case of like, you don't need the low end when other instruments come in. So you don't need low end really at all, but particularly when other instruments come in. Having said that, if, you know, if you're in a situation where it's just a vocal and acoustic, we could, uh, Jason, if you put both mics on, might be able to do something. It's going to mess around for a second. You know, one of the favorite things is to, for double miking, is to mic, you know, high and low at the same time. It's very middly. Move it around. How's the phase issue? Right. Well, that's where you sort of move it around. This this is a lot of like listening. You can do X Y. You could do an X Y with two of the same mic. That's actually sounding pretty good with the twelfth and fourteenth here. So and and then I know people either to mic at the very top here or at the very bottom. So another way to do it would be to take this all diaphragm here and pick up actually sort of all the way back here. Again, low end, low end cancellation now. Now I've got some of the body. So it's, even though this is two completely different microphones, Let's do this be silly. So I'm going to point one this way. Now I'm going to grab this one. And XY, even though it's not anything like this at all. Two completely different sounding ones, but they're close enough to capsule. I wonder what kind of phase issues. Totally untoward. Would never have thought about it working, but it actually sounds pretty good on the phase. And if this is just a vocal on acoustic, I don't use the stereo mic. It's not that bad of an idea because even though it's not suddenly like a wide acoustic, it just gives the acoustic a little bit of movement. So it's either not just mono or just panned here or just panned mm -hmm. there, it's just a little bit of body. It's like anything is getting creative, you know. Now I've got to throw out two mics like that and I've got dimension to the acoustic. Don't get me wrong, it's not super wide, like I was just saying a second ago, but what it is, it just has a little bit of movement into it. It's always gonna be difficult with double miking if you spread the, the mics. We've got an interesting place there where we had that one coming in here and then one on the 12th to 14th. The phase seems fairly consistent. Also, there wasn't much volume from this end of the guitar, so it wasn't too much phase cancellation because it wasn't picking up much. 
But here, a hodgepodge quickly thrown together gives us an interesting, you know, stereo image of a guitar that's narrow, but a little bit more interesting than just a mono mic. <laughs> Now I want to try this actually small and large diaphragm on some of my recordings. Do you ever go wide on? I mean, you, you can't really go too wide because if if let's just say if we get Nick, if, do you have another one of these ships? So Nick's going to grab another one of these ships and we'll do a proper X Y and we'll pull it back. Let's see how wide we can get it before when it actually sounds wide. It might not. You pretty much have to have two of the same mic. What you're if we're going to do a proper X Y, we'll do that. So he'll go and grab one and we'll do yeah. we'll do it back here somewhat. I don't think it's going to sound that wide. It's it's still ultimately one main source with peripheral information coming out. It's not like it sounds dramatically different in different areas. So it's just going to make it a little bit more interesting. Sound. Let's come back a little bit. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't sound wide or anything like that. It just sounds a bit more interesting than a boring single mic. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a vocal acoustic. This is a good way of doing it. The way I position the seating is like I'm not going straight to the sound hole. It's not directly in front of either of the mics. Just, just I've, I've consciously did that, but I didn't point it out to you guys. But look, this is kind of pointing here. So yes, it's going to get a bit of the sound hole. It's going to be. It's not directly in there. I'm sure if I suddenly went like this, it's going to be pretty unusable. Yeah. So common sense prevails. Like all of these things, common sense. You know, you do not want to point that directly at the sound hole. It's just going to be a woof. But it's pretty cool. It, it, to be honest, it sounds what I'm hearing here and what I'm hearing for that's very accurate. If I was doing a vocal acoustic singer songwriter, that's probably the way to go. You know, it's not like super pop and sparkly, but it's very, very natural. It just sounds like a well recorded, interesting acoustic. Have you tried uh, like sound radix auto align with, you know, a couple Multiple of mics? mics. If you had, if... It's kind of a catch 22 because sometimes this is, could be completely contentious, but sometimes when things are perfectly in phase, you get so much low end in there that it might just end up being unusable. You know, there are lots of people play with the fact that they're moving mics around and, and achieving slight wrongness, which make things wrong. It's a bit like with Reed Shippen when we did a masterclass once and Reed came down and somebody said, you know, when you're boosting all of that stuff, don't you worry about phase issues? And he's like, no. Sometimes that 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 phase cancellation or that that increase in EQ is exactly what he's looking for you know so it doesn't necessarily have to be scientific it just has to sound good so it just sounds like an interesting acoustic and if you since you mentioned this being good for a, a guitar and vocal where where would your vocal mic be if you were to do the setup if you're going to capture a, a, a vocalist now in the situation, it's going to be a dynamic microphone in Harpercolia pointing like this, yeah. as far away. Yeah. And you know, an another thing that people like to do is do the uh, is do the figure of eight mm -hmm. and the null point. So you could have the mic like this, and then the null point, if you get it just right, should be a lot of the projection of here. You just have to kind of experiment. It depends on how the player's playing. But usually, typically, dynamic microphone. You're going to have a bit of a hard time because the vocal's are always going to come into these mics. Yeah. But you can get away with dynamics and stuff pointing here with a pretty limited amount of bleed from the acoustic. That's if you can idea. get the singer to play separately and do, do it, then great. Then you're, all your problems are solved. But if you're only going to get an amazing performance by them singing and playing at the same time... But then there's other ways to cheat. I remember the first album I did in LA as a musician was with Don Smith, the great Don Smith uh, producing and engineering. And Don had done like, you know, Last Chance, Chance with Mary Jane. Don was his engineer. So he made so many great records. And he was a real 
gear aficionado. He had a small Neve sidecar. He had, he had 47s. He had Fairchilds. You know, he was back in the mid 90s, well before it was trendy to like vintage equipment. He had it all. And he would do things like to get around it, he, he would have the singer sort of speak the words. So, like, if you imagine this, you know, as soon as you're born, they make you feel small. So, it'd be like, as soon as you're born. So we'd have them kind of groove, groove to yeah. it, perform a little bit. Because then what would happen is like you play guitar to your vocal and you sing to your guitar. So it becomes this kind of, you know, as soon as you're born, they make you feel small. By giving, by giving, giving you no time in seven. You know, you're like, ah, pushing and pulling with that. So you take one of those elements away. It's just kind of... Well, it just becomes a little bit too rote and safe and boring and, and whatever. So he would just be like. You know, and then electric guitar, kitchen towel, paper towel on the strings here and here and just and you get and, and then they could still dig in and play. But it, the bleed was so minimal. It was almost non-existent, especially with 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 the, with the dynamic. And that was how he managed to preserve the performance of an acoustic guitar with a vocal and then a vocal with an acoustic guitar. It was very smart. I saw him do it. And even when we were doing full band stuff, uh, Julia, our singer, she just didn't have the timing unless she was playing guitar. So he gave, he gave her back that electric guitar with all the strings deadened and she was singing all the songs playing guitar as well. Because every time she... Would... She was singing those rhythms, you know. I think Jack told me the same things. When he did Double Fantasy, he said that John Lennon would play that... I want to say it was a Swedish guy who made it for him. Anyway, somebody made him like this crazy flying V. And that was his main guitar that he tracked with. And uh, on the whole Double Fantasy and Milk and Honey sessions. And so the vocals, he was playing guitar while singing, Oh, we're live together. But anyway, the point is, is like... He was strumming it, so it was all part of that thing. Because so many of their records, you know, and they're all were intrinsically done like that. You know, you've seen all the sessions of them in the studio. They're singing and playing. It doesn't mean they wouldn't re-sing, but they were tracking, you know, simultaneously in the same room while singing scratch vocals that sometimes became lead vocals, you know, and uh, it's all kind of what kept it all together. So these these guys are smart. We, we learned from Jack and... And, uh, and Don Smith. Mm -hmm.